Section 9, which is our next section, deals with mastoiditis and trauma to the ear. And it's still under sensory neural organs. The Section 6 to introduce students to management of patients with mastoiditis and trauma to the ear. Mastoiditis is common among children and students should be able to group the signs and symptoms in order to come out with the correct immediate management of such patients. And the key topics to be covered in the session are, we'll look at the definition, incidents, causes, classification, signs and symptoms, and the management. And it's expected that by the end of the lecture, students will be, to, will be able to explain mastoiditis discuss the signs and symptoms of ear trauma and describe the treatment modalities involved in the management. So our first topic is mastoiditis. In the picture, we have a child with mastoiditis. And once again, we are being referred to anatomy and physiology to revisit the mastoid process, which is the portion of the temporal bone of the skull that is behind the ear, which contains open air spaces. So mastoiditis is inflammation of the mucosa lining of the mastoid antrum and mastoid air cell system, which is inside the mastoid process. And it's usually the result of an infection of the middle ear, example, or azinotitis media, with which the mastoid cells also communicate. And mastoiditis can be acute or chronic. So in the picture, we have infection of the mastoid air cells, and that is mastoiditis, what occurs in mastoiditis. It usually affects children, and it used to be a leading cause of child mortality. And now with the evolution of antibiotics, mastoiditis is less dangerous and is relatively not common as it used to be. The causes, a lot of organisms may cause mastoiditis and these include streptococcus pneumoniae, streptococcus pyogens, staphylococcus aureus, aureus. we have hemophilus influenza, morazella catar catalyst, and then in untreated or complicated otitis media. We also have measles, sore throats. All these conditions may predispose a child or the individual to the development of mastoiditis. So the predisposing causes include untreated or, complica or complicated otitis media measles, sore throat, respiratory infections such as diphtheria, and we also have scarlet fever. So apart from the organisms, in untreated or complicated otitis and other conditions, patients may end up having mastoiditis or the mastoid gland may be affected. The treatment, antibiotics such as clindamycin may be given, and then also Rosefin. So we are referred to the slide for the dosages. Brufin may be given to relieve pain and the inflammation. Then steroids, paracetamol may also be given to relieve pain. And clarifinical eye drops may also be instilled into the ear. Usually only one antibiotic and one analgesic are used at a time. Now when we take the surgical treatment, surgery is recommended if it does not respond to medical treatment. And the surgeries that are performed include, include maringotomy, and with this one, a small incision is made in the tympanic membrane or eardrum to relieve pressure and allow drainage of serous or purulent fluid in the middle ear behind the tympanic membrane. Tympanostomy tube may also be inserted in the eardrum 
to drain the pus or serous fluid and help treat infection. Mastoidectomy, that is the surgical removal of the disease portion of the mastoid process, as well as the incus and malice of the middle ear and the tympanic membrane. May be done. So mastoidectomy may be done. And then the pre and post-op care patients is educated on various ways of communication since there may be hearing impairment. Patient is reassured of the availability of a hearing aid in case of hearing impairment. Antibiotics may be administered prior to surgery and ear swabbing for culture and sensitivity may isolate the particular organism causing the infection. Then examination and hearing tests include audiometry and unless operation, operation is urgent, it is desirable that the patient should be free of active upper respiratory tract infection and this will help to lessen the risk of post-operative complications. Then an appropriate Ear shave is done about two finger breaths away from the ear prior to surgery. Postoperatively, patient is reassured and side rails are kept as patient may experience dizziness due to stimulation of the inner ear. And prescribed analgesics are given for pain. Packed dressing is removed after four to five days. Antiemetics may be administered as prescribed to control nausea. Patient is advised to sleep on the unaffected ear. And daily wound dressing by surgeon's protocol is done. And the nurse with the operated, the patient should be nursed with the operated ear uppermost, usually lying on one pillow. Check or assessment for hearing and complications such as facial nerve paralysis and bleeding or facial drooping and vitiligo are all observed and patient is also observed for donor sites are inspected in cases of drafting and due to hearing loss precise instructions should be given to patients and he or she is encouraged to express concerns about hearing loss pen and paper may be provided to facilitate communication. So that's a small incision. It's made in the tympanic membrane and the tube is inserted to drain the fluid in the second picture. Post-op complications include distraction of the mastoid bone, there's dizziness of a tiger, epidural abscess, facial paralysis, meningitis, partial or complete hearing loss, and then spread of infection to the brain. The pathophysiology, the bacteria spread from the middle ear to the mastoid air cells where the inflammation causes damage to the bony structures. And the most common organisms recovered are the, the listed which have been mentioned earlier. So we now come to a second topic and that is trauma to the ear. So in the picture we have a diagram of the ear and once again you are being referred to your anatomy and physiology class. Ear trauma refers to damage caused by a direct blow to the ear and the trauma may affect not only the ear but the surrounding area as well and these include adjacent tissue and bone structure, trauma to the ears especially rupture of the tympanic membrane or eardrum is a frequent consequence of harsh beatings and trauma may be in the outer middle or in the inner ear. Conditions associated with ear trauma include ear infection, Meniere's disease, deafness, otitis externa, otitis media, tympanic membrane rupture, and then temporal bone fracture. Etiology, the causes include compression injuries, penetrating injuries, thermal injuries, lightening injuries, and then acoustic or loud noise. And the symptoms of ear trauma include ear bleeding, pain, redness of the ear, there may be swelling of the ear, ear bruising, the tenderness, bleeding from the ear canal, dizziness may occur, 
drainage from the ear canal and then ear canal swelling may also occur. There's hearing loss and then there may be vomiting as well. So diagnostic investigations include CT scan, audiometry, tympanometry, and then MRI scans. The treatments may include wound care for lacerations, abrasions, and then punctured wound treatment. So lacerations, abrasions, and punctured wounds are treated and cold compresses may be applied. Compression dressing may also be applied to the ears. And then antibiotic ear drops, such as gentamicin drops, cephalosporin, two to three drops, TID may also be given. And gentamicin may be given twice daily. Tetanus immunization may be given as necessary. Then non steroidal anti-inflammatory medications are given for pain and brufin, naproxen, and other medications may be given for pain and to relieve any inflammatory process. Narcotic pain medication may also be necessary for moderate to severe pain and is for short-term use. Surgery for middle ear injuries may be required and plastic surgery may also be done. Preoperatively, patient is assessed for hearing or we verify documentation preoperatively. Hearing assessment is done. Then patient is educated and a means of communication to be used after surgery is agreed upon. It should be explained to patients. Please remember that excessive blowing of the nose, coughing and sneezing should be restricted or may be restricted to prevent pressure changes in the middle ear and potential disruption of the surgical site. And if the client needs to cough or sneeze, you should leave the mouth open. This minimizes pressure and changes in the middle ear. Patient is assessed for bleeding. Antiemetics are administered as ordered and the head of the bed is elevated and patient is also assessed for vertigo or dizziness, especially with movement. And then patient's hearing is also assessed and instructions for home care, such as prevention of contamination to the ear or contamination of the ear, keeping the outer ear plug clean and dry and changing it as needed. Patient is told to avoid blowing of the nose. So all these are important client and family teachings that should be given before patient goes home. Patient is told to avoid swimming and then also patient is told to notify the physician or the doctor in cases of severe or increased dizziness, decreased hearing after discharge, since these are indications of complications. Infections of the ear can result in hearing impairment, so any infection should be investigated and treated with the right antibiotic. An effective patient and family teaching is necessary to prevent trauma to the eye. Infections of the ear can result in hearing impairment, so any infection should be investigated and treated with the right antibiotic. And effective patient and family teaching is also necessary to prevent trauma to the ear. The following are your references. You can refer to these books for further reading as regards trauma to the ear. Thank you. Thank you.